listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 21st, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Our presenter is Dr. Neha Patel. She's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I'm going to talk about exercise-induced anaphylaxis today. So we'll start off with a question. So which of the following foods has been commonly associated with food-specific exercise-induced anaphylaxis? Is it A, egg, C, peanut, C, soybean, or D, wheat? And we'll go over there at the end. <laughs> you can't sort of see my mind. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so I wanted to just start with uh, a case presentation of a patient I saw um, during fellowship. So this was a 17-year-old male who presented with a three-month history of intermittent episodes of hives. He said they came on with strenuous exercise, and then whenever he was very hot or sweaty, um, they would come on as well. He described them as very itchy, um, and he said they usually resolved within 10 to 20 minutes after his body cooled down. And then more recently, one month ago, he was running about two or three miles. And then after he had finished doing that, when he came inside the house, he developed hives all over his body, head to toe, within 10 minutes. He also complained of shortness of breath, lightheadedness, wheezing, tongue swelling, and throat closing. He was then taken to urgent care at Joplin and treated with epinephrine, Benadryl, and he reports that his symptoms improved within a few minutes. Prior to going to run that morning, he said that he ate a toaster scramble, which had eggs and bacon in it. Um, and this was about an hour before he exercised. He said he typically doesn't do much running, and this was actually more exercise than he usually does. Um, so he's not very active. He doesn't report taking any other medications during that time. He said he didn't take any aspirin, ibuprofen, or any other new medication. He is on Adderall, ADHD and he reports that he does take that every morning. And he did take it the morning of episode as well, probably within about an hour or so um, prior to the onset. He doesn't report any history of any uh, allergic rhinitis symptoms um, or conjunctivitis symptoms. He doesn't have any asthma. Um, apart from the ADHD, pretty healthy, but not, not have any other medical problems. In terms of his medication, as I mentioned, he just takes Adderall. Um, in the morning, and then he was more recently after his visit to the urgent care, he was prescribed with an EpiPen, um, but he has not used that since um, he did not report any drug allergies. So review of systems was pretty um, benign. The only thing he complained of was over the last six months, he had had these intermittent episodes of hives um, with sweating and then more recently after some exercise. Uh, otherwise, he did not report anything else. No joint pains, um, no myalgias, no fevers, um, and, and nothing else to report. There was no family history of any asthma or allergies, um, hives, or immunodeficiency, um, and he was not aware of anyone in the family who had these symptoms. So he lives in Joplin, Missouri, um, with his grandparents. They live in a rural area. He um, doesn't report any damp or mold exposure at home. They do have one dog and one cat. As I said, he's never had any of um, He does say that his grandmother smoked cigarettes, but only outdoors. In terms of his physical exam and clinic, um, he looked normal, um, well-developed, no evidence of any failure to thrive, uh, regular rate and rhythm. He did not have any um, urticaria or any hives at that time, um, and he was negative for dementia. Uh, really nothing of you know, um, and everything else is normal. So in terms of um, differential diagnosis, so we're thinking about obviously with the hives and the episode of shortness of breath and swelling after the exercise, 
think about maybe exercise-induced anaphylaxis versus maybe food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis given that he had eaten within an hour of the episode. So we're also worried about possible mast cell disorders because of the severity of his reaction. And then with him taking Adderall, obviously, always think about any side effects of any medicines you are taking. And then with his history of having um, the symptoms for the last six months with sweating, being exposed to heat, which resolves when he cools down, we also think about possible cholinergic urticaria, um, <coughs> body temperature. <coughs> So in terms of labs, um, we did check a baseline triplase um, to see on the last mass cell before it was normal. And then we did just check for egg and milk because that was in the total sample. Um, and then foie gum was also in there, so we thought that maybe we should check that. It was possible that he may have had an immediate um, anaphylaxis to a food too, um, with it being so close to him eating. So that all came back. What is, what is it closer surrounding? It's like a toaster strudel, but instead of the like artificial fruit, it has oh, like stuff. ham and cheese. Pop up tart, but with ham and cheese. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Well, pop tart's a little pop -tart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's The epitome of artificial food. Yes. But not the toaster scramble, pop tart. The well, the toaster scramble. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Except okay. 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 <laughs> in the toaster, so it's like um, everything in the sandwich sort oh, of thing. Okay. Stick in the toaster and eat them. So like it's a breakfast that you make at home, you know, put in the toaster. It, yeah. It's sort of like a breakfast burrito or something like that. And you shove it's in the toaster and eat. Try to process. You just warm up. <laughs> I have to admit, I did this out as well. <laughs> so we recommended um, to trial uh, the effect ten again twice a day. So we're thinking, well, you've had multiple episodes of urticaria. Um, maybe this is more chronic. Um, as well, so we recommended that. We did say to avoid um, strenuous exercise, especially if he's going to be sweating a lot because that could, that would triggered his episodes in the past. We did um, recommend as they lived in Joplin, Missouri, um, gave them a prescription with a trip days level, so if he had any future episodes that they could check that, so that could help us. Um, and then we did recommend not eating um, or drinking anything four hours before the exercise or to exercise with a partner or do graded exercise um, and not do um, such severe exercise that he's not really We also told him to avoid um, any non-steroidals or any alcohol at least 24 hours before any exercise. Um, and then looking into Adderall, we found that the peak effect is about two or three hours. Um, so we did recommend not taking Adderall or not exercising within four hours of taking that medicine. Um, in case that that was the culprit. And we were all just kind of precautions until we could figure out um, what else could be going on. And then we could just start with F10 and then follow up in clinic. So I'm going to talk about um, exercise induced anaphylaxis to him. So it's a clinical syndrome in which anaphylaxis occurs in conjunction with exercise or any other significant physical activity. And it was described over three decades ago, um, so it has been well known. In terms of the epidemiology, the female to male ratio is about 2 to 2.5, with adolescents and young adults actually accounting for most of the reported cases. Unfortunately, um, the true prevalence is actually unknown because it may not be diagnosed um, or documented as a diagnosis, but for the most part, it is pretty rare from what, what I read. So it was initially described in the 1980s. Um, there was a case report of 16 patients who had been exercising for several years before then developing anaphylaxis related to that athletic activity. And that's kind of when um, it was first coined. So there are multiple different types of exercise-induced anaphylaxis that I'll go into. Um, but the classic type is originally described as four phases. So initially you get a prodromal phase um, where you may just feel tired, fatigued, um, warmth, um, may have itching or paritis. And then this is followed by the early phase where then you get the hives or the epicarial eruption. Then some people will get the established phase where you get more severe um, symptoms of anaphylaxis or hypertension, syncope, um, um, vomiting, diarrhea, things like that. And then the final phase is when it, the urticaria is not prolonged. Continue for um, a prolonged period of time rather than resolving within um, 
it can last for a few hours or so. And then there is a variant type um, of exercise-induced anaphylaxis where um, typically you will get giant hives and you can differentiate this from cholinergic urticaria where you usually get the pinpoint um, urticaria, but in variant type you typically don't see the giant hives. So then you see the small untake um, skin lesions which are more typical cholinergic urticaria. And so that can um, make the diagnosis a little bit confusing. But in this case, rather than cholinergic urticaria, we usually get the pinpoint highs and it usually doesn't progress to more than that. Um, when it's more exercise-induced anaphylaxis, this can be followed by hypertension shock if it's not treated um, or diagnosed um, early enough. And then there is some uh, familiar type, uh, which has been described in some case reports. They haven't really been able to establish a, an inheritance pattern for that. And then, as I mentioned, um, medications can also cause this. And there have been reported cases with non-steroidals, in particular aspirin, um, alcohol as well, and then different antibiotics as well. Um, we didn't really find anything that Adderall was related to. But again, um, there's another medication just to think about. And then there's um, food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis, um, which is important to know that as well, which I'll talk about. So in terms of um, the physiology um, of exercise-induced anaphylaxis, the actual specific physiological changes that occur um, to trigger the muscle activation is not completely um, known at this time, but it is definitely thought to be muscle mediated granulation, which causes um, elevations in plasma histamine and serum tryptase which results in the symptoms of the urticaria and then the hypertension and syncope and shock if it's um, allowed to progress. So the, the other main thing about this condition is that it's not always related to exercise. So it doesn't always happen every time they exercise and there may be different severities of exercise so that makes it more confusing in that some patients may um, exercise only you know, only strenuous exercise brings it on where they're able to do other forms of exercise without having any symptoms. Um, and then sometimes they may exercise without any symptoms. So it's kind of sporadic in terms of um, how it may present. So there really is no good way to predict if symptoms would occur um, during that particular episode. Um, and that's why it's important to um, have the precautions in place every time they exercise once they've been diagnosed um, because you don't know which, which time they're going to have these symptoms. So as I mentioned, in terms of um, clinical features, really the same symptoms that you would see with most um, anaphylaxis from other causes, um, although you obviously want to link it to some form of physical expression that occurred before it. Again, symptoms can begin at any stage of the exercise, and occasionally it can occur after um, they stop exercising. Um, so just want to kind of get a timeline of um, when symptoms occur and what may have preceded it as well as things like that. Typically, the attacks will begin um, five minutes into moderate or heavy exercise. Again, they may begin after the exercises as well. And in some cases, the symptoms may be um, aborted just by stopping exercising. But in other cases, even if you stop exercising, the symptom may still progress, in which case you, you may need treatment in terms of antihistamines or epinephrine. Most episodes will resolve within 30 minutes um, to four hours on average, um, and they rarely um, extend longer than that. And this is just a table kind of going through um, the common symptoms that most people get. And as you can see, commonest are urticaria and pruritus, and that's why um, it's important to think about it in your differential. Anyone that may present with just um, urticaria because there's multiple different types of it. Um, and then you get to the more severe symptoms, so the shortness of breath, um, syncope, and then the GI symptoms as well, which is more the um, anaphylaxis type symptoms. But most patients may just have pruritus, urticaria, um, and angioedema. So in terms of diagnosis, um, if you have someone that's presenting with these kinds of symptoms and it coincides with or during or shortly after exercising, you should think about it. You should also focus on identifying possible co-triggers, such as ingestion of specific foods or non-steroidals or alcohol and other medications. Um, as those can also be um, contributing to the symptoms. So in terms of um, differential diagnosis, this is just a table that kind of goes through the common things um, that you would think about, the food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis, which I'll go into 
um, later, which basically combines a food trigger as well as the exercise, the two triggers causing the symptoms, and then exercise induced anaphylaxis, which is usually not related to any food, um, but again, may not always just be exercise triggered. Um, and then, of course, I deem food allergy just because the answer is obviously within um, two hours of any exercise or any food, so think about that. And then the different types of urticaria, in particular cholinergic and cold induced urticaria. As I mentioned, the main thing to think about when you're differentiating between cholinergic and exercise induced is the size of the hive, so pinpoint with cholinergic, and then um, typically uh, exercise induced anaphylaxis, the hives are going to be much larger. Um, and I'll just show you some pictures in a minute. And then mastocytosis, just the cause of the severity um, of symptoms and what kind of present you with anaphylaxis that might be severe, you want to rule that out. Um, and then lastly, which is pretty rare, but um, hereditary and <coughs> especially if there's a family history as well, um, you want to think about that. So this is um, some of the exercise that has been associated with anaphylaxis, as you can see. The, um, just from um, walking, not very strenuous exercise, depending on how fast you're walking, I guess. Um, but even breaking um, knees, shoving snow, things that you may not think of exercise, more activities of daily living that are strenuous for that patient that can be something that triggers it. Um, so, so think about these things as well, not just all oh, they're running, um, going biking and things like that. And then in terms of diagnosis, um, you can do an exercise challenge, um, which can confirm the diagnosis. But unfortunately, just like um, with methacholine challenges for asthma and things like that, an active challenge doesn't necessarily exclude the diagnosis. Um, so you may end up just using the history and then the clinical um, history to kind of make the diagnosis. And exercise challenge is not common for these patients, but it, you know, if they will really stuck and it's something you want to do. You can do that, but keep in mind that if it's negative, it doesn't necessarily get it out. Um, and as I mentioned, the really is an protocol for these exercise challenges in terms of diagnosing exercise-induced anaphylaxis, um, particularly for other people. You can um, link it like if they start having hives and other symptoms, you can definitely um, diagnose it that way. And then in terms of physical findings, there really isn't anything specific to exercise-induced anaphylaxis. It's more um, looking at their physical exam to make sure you're not missing other diagnoses. So do they have a tertiary pigmentosa, which might indicate maybe mast cell disorder? Do they have anything else going on? Um, that might help you kind of differentiate in terms of your differential diagnosis. So here's a picture just to remind you all um, what a tertiary pigmentosa looks like. So you kind of get the, um, they describe them as yellowy brown um, pigmentation. Uh, macros are pretty well circumscribed, um, and in daily to get multiple ones, you may even just get a single one for a solitary one in some patients. And then these are um, the pinpoint wheels that you typically get in cholinergic particularia, and that's when you're increasing the body temperature. And typically, as you guys know, um, with cholinergic urticaria, it's when you cool down, it's when you're going to get the hive. And then that's opposed to these much larger ones that you can see here um, that are typically described as exercise-induced anaphylaxis. You get these larger wheels. Um, and these are also found in dependent exercise-induced urticaria as well as cold-induced urticaria. Um, and you may also um, get them to see that as you so There are multiple different um, causes of it, but that may help you. <coughs> in terms of lab, um, as I said, depending on the history, you may want to get a baseline serum triptase level. Probably recommend it in all patients that you do present with any type of anaphylaxis. Um, and typically, it's going to be normal in exercise-induced anaphylaxis at this time. But obviously, during an episode, um, it may be elevated. And in mastocytosis, it will both be elevated um, both during an episode and then also normal at baseline will be elevated as well. And then if you um, take the history and you're concerned that maybe food-induced, exercise-induced anaphylaxis, or um, you feel that, oh, maybe it was a food allergy rather than the exercise maybe being a red herring, then, you know, skin testing or doing any um, lab testing for the particular food they may have ingested, as well as environmental um, allergens may be useful as well to kind of differentiate, are there any other triggers as well as exercise that may have caused it?
So in terms of the natural history of exogenous anaphylaxis, um, as I mentioned, it's pretty rare. There hasn't been many studies done on it, but there have been some professional analyses of individuals who had these symptoms, and they basically used questionnaires to identify these patients. Um, and they said that those subjects that were included in this analysis meant the criteria for exogenous anaphylaxis if they had anaphylactic symptoms, increased hypertension, or difficulty breathing, as well as urticarial angioedema associated with physical exertion, but without a passive increase in whole body temperature. So they tried to differentiate those patients that might also have a component of cholinergic urticaria in order to kind of get a better idea of um, the natural history of this condition. So subjects typically reported that their frequency of episodes actually decreased since the initial episodes, so that just suggests that over time the severity and the frequency may decrease. Um, they also prevented suicidal attacks by, you know, doing multiple avoidance measures, so preventing exercising during very hot or very cold weather. They prevent eating foods, as I said, within three or four hours of the intensive exercise, and then, um, you know, exercising with a partner or sometimes restricting exercise at certain seasons, so if they're very allergic or they have coexisting allergic rhinitis that's really bad in the fall, they may um, have chosen not to exercise during that season because that may trigger their symptoms further. In terms of treating these patients, um, this cross-sectional analysis said that the most common agents used were H1 antagonists, but about 20% <coughs> used no treatment at all. As you can say, because it's pretty sporadic, some, pa some people may not want to take um, long-term antihistamines just to prevent the episodes. And then in terms of the foods, shellfish, tomatoes, and wine were actually the most frequently reported triggers. Um, and that's why alcohol is one of those things that we recommend um, to prevent ingestion of within about 24 hours of intended exercise. But cheese, milk, and celery was also reported as common um, triggers. And then, as I mentioned, that most of these subjects, the frequency and severity of these attacks decreased over time or stayed the same. For the most part, they didn't seem to get worse or progress to anything um, more than what they had initially experienced. So in terms of um, management, so the acute management of exercise-induced anaphylaxis is actually the same um, as management of any type of anaphylaxis. You'll always want to recommend that patients carry an EpiPen, um, recommend that they exercise with supervision, so exercise with a friend um, or a partner, someone who definitely is trained in giving the EpiPen as well is important um, because obviously when they're having the episode, they may not be able to um, get to their EpiPen, so it's important to do that. We do recommend that they stop exercising immediately at the first sign of symptoms. So even if they just get a few highs or maybe think they might be having some problems, recommend that they stop exercising rather than continue until it gets worse. And then if they do, are able to identify any co-triggers such as non-steroidals, alcohol, other medications, um, particular foods, um, then we do recommend avoidance of those um, at least four hours before the intended exercise. In terms of pharmacological therapy, it hasn't been very well studied. Um, they do say that prevention really remains the best treatment and management for these patients. Most patients, as I said, report fewer attacks over time, and this is really um, because they modify their exercise habits or they use prevention um, and recognize the co-triggers and prevent those, and that actually results in obviously fewer attacks over time. And then, as I mentioned, prognosis is generally favorable. It doesn't seem to get worse over time. But there has been um, one fatality reported. So um, it is important to definitely educate patients on this and that it can be a life-threatening condition. Um, the prevention is really the main, the main um, treatment and management. Questions on that before I go into um, food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis? I was just curious <clears throat> if uh, if these if these patients um, um, if they um, did almost like a conditioning process where they they exercise small bits and increase it gradually over time would they be more protected sort of like someone who has colon or mm -hmm. area who you know goes in the water and gets exposed to cold water and then gradually gets more and more and more so they can tolerate that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the studies that they've done in the analysis and the case reports, they do 
recommend it. They haven't actually looked at like doing like a graded challenge and then looking at those patients and see if that reduce their um, symptoms over time. Um, so it's possible. I mean, it makes sense that they do say just reducing the exercise or not doing a strenuous use it before seems to work. So because if I wasn't mistaken, maybe I was, but I thought in your in your presentation you said that um, this person had when he had the episode had been uh, running, but it, it was more strenuous than mm -hmm. he normally did. Yeah. So the thing is, is that like when you said like shoveling the snow, is it someone who you know you shovel the snow a few times in the winter, and then you mm -hmm. have a big snowfall, and you're out there shoveling? And you have an episode, or you know, a lot of people have heart attacks because so, yeah. you're it's so much more than you're used to doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So is it less likely to have that happen in someone who's a like a trained athlete as opposed to a weekend warrior sort of person? <laughs> Could be, but then they just I mean, the initial cases they described were an athlete, so it's yeah, not necessarily that they were trained um, to the left. Like they have, I guess, it's all dependent each person has their conditions, but. Um, there are cases that even athletes who are pretty well conditioned, so I'm not really sure what might trigger it in even those patients. So, so yeah, it would be good if that was the case, because then you could um, tell them not to show up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a lot easier to figure this all out if we knew what the heck was going on with this disease. Right, we don't really know what the really underlying know what's going baseline on. is. So. Can I ask a question with regards to each one? I'm, I'm unclear as to the rationale for giving H1 to prevent anaphylaxis. Is that what they're trying to do? So they, I think they're trying to prevent more of the care undertaking that may progress to anaphylaxis. Do you know if that actually has been shown to progress? No, not in the studies I read. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's more if they're having very frequent episodes or if there's coexisting at Polynesia get to carry on that as well, then you might want to do that. So has anyone taken a whole bunch of people with this disease, that, so that, that already precludes it because nobody has a whole bunch of patients with this yeah. disease to gather, but if you could gather a whole bunch of people with this disease and if they each had the same disease and not the homogeneous group of different diseases that were kind of grouping together, then you could randomly assign half of them to antihistamines and half of them to a placebo and see whether it actually helps. <clears throat> Learning that, we really don't know. It's only anecdotal, it's circumstantial. Who the heck knows if it helps or not? Most patients say that it does, but who knows? The, the other thing is, I mean, just think of someone who has a food allergy. If someone has some mild symptoms, you give them an antihistamine um, to try to get rid of those symptoms. But the hope is that you're slowing down a reaction so it doesn't progress to anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. And you know, so most the, patients say that they get better with it? Pardon me? Most patients who take yeah. an antihistamine say yeah. that it works. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people that think, you know, you should automatically get from that, but I don't have any symptoms at all, which is beyond me. But um, <laughs> but the, um, but I, I think it's the same thing. And then, again, it's a relatively benign therapy. It's, as Naya said, some of these patients may have, may not have symptoms every time, um, and they may just have some hives or something. So, and then you may have overlapping chronic urticaria or cholinergic urticaria at the same time. So there's, I don't think there's any downside to doing that, mm -hmm. you know, um, at all. What so. about this concern of masking a reaction? Does anybody understand that concept? Yeah. I've never understood it, so could you explain it to me? Oh, I understand that the idea behind it, like if you give, you know, antihistamines chronically, would they could they still be having a bad reaction? You just don't see it until it's too late kind of thing? Is that what you mean? Yeah, well, I always thought that if you mask it, that was good because then you yeah. have it. So that's the whole idea is to mask it, is to get rid of it so they don't have it. Mm -hmm. The idea that if you mask, that having some mild symptoms sort of is a marker for that later on you're going to have more severe symptoms, so therefore you want to see the earlier symptoms so you mm -hmm. stop before it progresses to a point where the antihistamine is no longer can help. I'm, I'm not sure that there's any evidence for that. That's that's all theoretical, and I hear it all the time. But when asked to really explain it or understand it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I would rather mask it and not have to deal with it personally. I with you on that. So, but but you'll hear it all the time. Yeah. Why don't you? Oh see? yeah. So yeah. So as Dr. Dowling said, it's more. Preventing progression, it's more on case reports. There really hasn't been any studies done on whether that really prevents it. I think the other thing is about the bottom line is that um, you're 
you're telling someone that they have this disease, you can't tell them when it's going to happen, right. and you're you're they're looking for something that makes them you know gives them some confidence that it may not be happening all the time, and so that's the other that's the other thing. It's not even psychologic because um, just giving an EpiPen here said when you when you start having other aspects of data like to shoot yourself and go to the emergency room. Um, doesn't give you much confidence. Yeah, they just feel more comfortable. They're going to become, they're gonna become terrified of doing exercise if you do that. I mean, yeah, it, it, really people are, have so much okay. fear and anxiety in our society anyway. I think we're adding to it by doing that. But go ahead. Okay. So, um, so the part I wanted to concentrate on with the pen exercises with anaphylaxis is more so because it does come up a lot in terms of what but also it's important to. Um, no, or a differential diagnosis. So there's two types. There's specific food um, exercise-induced anaphylaxis and then non-specific food exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Um, so these patients can basically eat the food in question without symptoms in the absence of exercise. But then when you put them together, uh, then they get symptoms. So they can exercise as long as they haven't eaten that food. They can eat that food as long as they haven't exercised. <laughs> but when you put them together, and some patients can get um, superpenic exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And when I say specific and non-specific, meaning that there may be just a particular food that if they eat that and then exercise, they get symptoms, um, whereas some patients, which is much rarer, it can be with any food. So they, even if they eat something that they've eaten multiple times, um, any food they eat before exercise will cause symptoms. So again, um, the pathogenesis has not been very well defined, um, but they do feel like that maybe during exercise you increase, um, obviously, gastric permeability during exercise, and that might allow the entry of intact unprocessed proteins um, into the circulation, but obviously not when you're not exercising. So that's been one um, theory that people have documented, but again, um, there really isn't much um, studies that have been done on it, and we really don't know why. Some people, a specific food causes it, and why in some people any food can cause it. And again, um, non-steroidals and then alcohol can also be cofactors for food dependence, so induced anaphylaxis as well as um, yeah. exercise induced alone. Yeah, Char Charlie, do, do you believe that foods get absorbed into the circulation mm -hmm. with or without exercise? Not whole foods. I mean, that's just... Yeah, they just don't get in. We, we, yeah. we tried that out with, we didn't exercise, but we tried it with the peanuts. Right. right? I ate an entire jar of peanuts and <laughs> measured my blood every 15 minutes. There's, there's not a single nanogram of peanut allergen in the blood. It doesn't get in. I guess we just don't know. Someone wanted yeah. to document I mean, something. You know, <laughs> as soon as it hits the stomach, uh, it, 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 it goes in an acid environment. There are lots of really serious enzymes in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts to get chewed up. Yeah. You know, about the, <laughs> about the biggest thing you get. Blood is apparently considered to be a dipeptide, maybe. Now, that doesn't say if, if maybe they have some tears in the intestine that you won't get exposure. You know, the, the uh, allergen-presenting cells that line the intestine, if you get a, an overload of exposure, I can see where that would, that would cause a big reaction. But I just don't see it getting systemic. There's just mm. too many things in there that are, that are going to fight it. To be honest, I've looked for it. I've, I've actually looked through the literature to find evidence that any food actually can be detected in blood after ingestion, and I've not found a single paper that's documented that. So this is all theoretical, mm -hmm. and I think it's probably been disproven. If it doesn't happen, so I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that foods do not get into the blood. Having said that, though, there seems to be a clear correlation between foods and having exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Yeah, so yeah, but it's not because they're getting why. into the blood. In what do you think? Patients studied. I mean, we don't, I don't know if they studied those patients. Or not. Right, they probably didn't study, study those patients. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would have somebody eat a whole bunch of celery and see if you pick up celery allergens. It's, it's hard to do that study because I, unless you really like celery, but um, cause that's one of the foods she's gonna. Peanut butter. Do you really yeah, ever butter. inject IV a protein that's a non-human protein? Can you think of anything? Of course, immunoglobulin. Yeah. That, does that get injected IV or is that IM? If you're giving horse immunoglobulin and you get snake well, bites or something like that, that's yeah. IM. Yeah, that's IM. But, it's, but IM gets absorbed into the blood because it's, it's in the circulation. So, so I'm just 
pointing this out because it really, uh, the dogma, the conventional wisdom that you eat these foods and then they get into your blood and that's why you have anaphylaxis, I think you really need to start questioning that. And it's okay to question conventional wisdom because that's the only way we're going to make progress. Right now we have this disease, we have no clue what's going on. These references are from the 90s and 80s, 1980, 1990. I remember when it was being studied. We've made no progress at all. This belief system and these dogmatic assumptions about it have given us no value at all. They've not helped us to progress. So we need to start thinking differently about these things. You guys, as the next generation of, of thought leaders, need to consider the possibility that everything you're being taught today is incorrect other than just the observational epidemiology stuff, but the description of what happens. But the potential path yeah. pathogenesis and mechanisms and all of that, these are all just guesses and assumptions and dogmatic beliefs that are based on no evidence at all. So you really need to be very skeptical of what you're hearing. Not, not that Dr. Patel is not giving you the right information. I definitely respect what you're saying. But, but just be very skeptical and, oh, and think about Today possible right. alternatives to the, poten to the mechanisms that the thought leaders that we have today have put out. Because those thought leaders have not helped us to make progress in this field. I'm done for today. I'm going home now. <laughs> you're done. Yeah, we're done. Bye. No, go, go ahead. OK. So the important part, which uh, Tommy comes up is which foods are implicated as induced anaphylaxis. So wheat is a common one, and then shellfish and celery, as Dr. Portner mentioned, um, is a common one as well. The and other celery. Have been mm -hmm. How can you be allergic to celery? Well, you ever I seen a rabbit have anaphylaxis? Actually, rabbits can have anaphylaxis. Go on. <laughs> Um, so as I said, most patients will have the specific kind where they develop symptoms only after eating a specific food, whereas rarely patients have described symptoms after eating other foods or maybe one or two foods together. So there's multiple variations that can occur. Um, again, this is all just case reports. There haven't been um, big studies and most of the studies are pretty old because that's the point we're making as well. So this is just a table, um, which was on the two other three. Um, of the cattail. So this is, is a common food that has been associated or linked to either by case reports. So there's a and shellfish, um, celery, but apparently milk, and then contaminated food with dust mites. There's also one that might come up as well. Pancake? Yeah, I heard of that. Yeah. Pancake mix that was like at their cottage and it's been there for about years. And that makes sense because that would have wheat pantry and and a lot of dust. <laughs> a lot of dust. <laughs> and it, yeah, it gets full of dust mites because they've been eating. If you, evidently, if you live in in South America or where in warmer climates, you don't use much flour because you really can't store flour. It gets mites in it, and they they contaminate it very fast. Yeah, and then the dust mites have triple mites, and so then it cross reacts with shellfish, crustaceans. <laughs> So the anaphylaxis from flour that's contaminated is due to crustacean tropomycin allergy, which is DERP-10. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. That's so cool. <laughs> so the only study that I could find was done in wheat. In, oh, yeah. Um, wheat dependency, exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And so they kind of use this as a model um, to describe other perspectives. Um, they say it's actually an immediate hypersensitivity to the gluten um, that underlies the disease. Mm -hmm. Kind of goes against. Um, <laughs> you know, what we try A19. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they talk about the omega-5 piadin mm -hmm. as being the allergen that's being identified as the cause of um, excess anaphylaxis and heat dependence. Um, and it's only five <laughs> Japanese patients were used in the study. So you can see how rare this is and how limited the data is. Um, but they found that these patients had single skin break, Western blood, breast cancer. That's how they identified the omega 5 the I mean, that's the main allergen um, for that. I only mentioned it because it does still come up on board, even though it's so rare and not great mm. studies on it. But um, yeah, they may ask you. Let's try A19. So there's a component test for that if you. 
Have the letters of Honduras. Try A. Try A. Try what is we? Tritium. Trifida. Huh? Trifida. Oh. Trifida. A, whatever A is. Is that their name? Like the Triticali. DSP one. Yeah. Triticali. Like awesome. Mind blown. <laughs> Quadro triticatum. That's the, what the wheat was in Star Trek. Remember the <laughs> one with the, the triples? Triples? Triples, yeah. Triples. <laughs> triples. The trouble with triples. There's quadra triticale. Oh, my head. <laughs> and a lot older than you are, too. <laughs> 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 so again, the diagnosis is mainly clinical, so signs and symptoms um, you need to get a good timeline of when the anaphylaxis occurred, what they did prior to the episode, um, and then as I said, the basement and foods at that time. And then it's really more of a diagnosis of exclusion because it's so rare, so you want to make sure that you're not missing anything else um, that might explain the clinical presentation. If there is a specific food implicated, then you can do specific IgE testing to that food, either by skin or blood testing. Um, and then, as I say, the main thing is that they don't have any symptoms if they eat that food in the absence of exercise or exercise without eating that food. So should their IgE, should their IgE be higher than for the food? They can they still can be eat? high, but okay. then just like you get false positives as well, that they may not have symptoms. Okay. At time, but because, but I guess they're still sensitized. Yeah. They are still sensitized. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But mm -hmm. they need the exercise as a co-trigger mm -hmm. as well. Is that why my mother told me not to go in the pool? Or at least they have <laughs> <a> <laughs> <trip>. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> There's probably some kid that had exercise. Who did you dentalaxis? And that's why all those mothers got that story. I, I, I think pool. it was cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was to give the parents time to eat and talk. Uh, yeah. I thought you get a real reason. reason. <laughs> I thought it would they give you a chance. So, the so that they could sit around and eat and talk and wouldn't have to go to the pool to watch the kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would think if the kids went to the pool, they wouldn't have to deal with them. Yeah, there's lifeguards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so I said earlier the exercise challenge may help to confirm it, but it does not um, rule out as it's next. So other cofactors that have also been noted, um, so we talked about food and then warm or cold temperature, so a cold pool. Um, high humidity, early drugs to give you aspirin and osteoidal. Um, and then also menstrual cycle may be implicated in some patients. Um, that might be something you want to ask for female patients. And then seasonal allergies as well. I mentioned that some um, patients in other studies, they prevented the episodes by not exercising in that allergic season. So to summarize, um, exercise-induced anaphylaxis is a disorder in which anaphylaxis occurs in response to physical exertion. It may or, not, may or may not occur on every episode of physical exertion. The severity may vary depending on the um, genuity of the exercise. And as I mentioned, a subset of patients may have food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis in which symptoms only occur within a few hours of eating either specific food or any food. Um, and then sensational exercise usually results in improved resolution of symptoms as long as you're doing it, you know, at the first onset of any symptoms. The frequency and the predictability with which symptoms occur highly variable among patients, and that's what makes it very difficult. Um, and then vigorous forms of exercise such as jogging, sound aerobics are more often implicated, as we mentioned, it really depends on the patient and something that may not we may not think is strenuous might be strenuous for them. So they have to that to them. And then really only prevention and education it remains the best treatment because we have used this um, study because it is such a rare condition. Oh, I wasn't meant to highlight that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you all know <laughs> that the most commonly associated food um, that's implicated in people's death and then we also mentioned shellfish and celery. That's an uncommon one. So questions? I, I do have a question with regards to the testing of the specific IgE. So you're doing testing to rule out a classic IgE mediated anaphylaxis. And if this patient had, you know, specific IgE to egg of two, then you'd say, okay, you know, avoid all egg. But in the absence of any positive specific IgE, mm -hmm. you would still say avoid eating food before exercise, right? So it helps 
rule in a possible idea. It helps to rule it in, and it might confirm with specific but, it but then you may not, yeah, exactly, you may still not know what. And it may not be the food either, right? It may be a coincidence that they had eaten something, but um, that's why, because we don't know, it's just more the prevention of any epitotus don't eat or anything with it. Um, so we don't know the likelihood ratio of an IgE to a food EIB to EI. Do you know if any studies look at you know specific IgE levels being minimally elevated in these patients, so not significant enough to cause you know classic anaphylaxis? But the thing is, the height, the size of the level, of the height of the level, or the size of the skin test tells you nothing about advanced life. It tells you about more like the yeah, I reaction. But I, I remember two patients I saw as a fellow. One was a guy who um, um, came in after having anaphylaxis playing basketball and was driving with his buddies. And they were drinking beer. And, um, and then, then about a month later, he had another episode where he had a late lunch where he had pizza. And then after work, he went to play basketball with his buddies at the local gym after work and had anaphylaxis again. <clears throat> and he was tested positive for weed, didn't have any problems. He could eat pizza by itself, did drink beer by itself, but if he did the two, um, and he had had a couple other episodes before when he thought about back before that weren't as bad that basically were kind of similar. Um, and he was positive. You know, we test him to some things. He was positive. So he, I don't remember what the severity of the, the, you know, if it was a class three or if it was a three plus on skin test. I don't remember. I think we did skin test on um, But he avoided... Um, any wheat products, um, or actually we told him to avoid any eating for a couple hours before episodes. He never had another episode, at least when I was there for another year. Um, then we had another girl. We had a girl who was a star basketball player for a local um, college basketball team <clears throat> who um, started having episodes of anaphylaxis. And um, um, I remember when you put up that thing about the menstrual cycle, we were trying to think of all these things, you know, went through the whole thing and about all this stuff. But she was, her history was that she um, had, um, used to, she used to have, I don't know, whatever she ate before a, a game, <clears throat> and she decided that it was whatever she used to eat before a game, or like carb loading or whatever was too much for, and it was like too heavy on her stomach because she was the star player and was asked to play most of the game. So she decided that she was going to start eating salads, and so she would have a salad before a game, <clears throat> and um so when she started doing that, she she had like two episodes of anaphylaxis where she collapsed on the court, um, and they had to take her to the emergency room. And so then she came to see us, and um, and I remember looking this stuff up for what they had back in you know 1990 or whatever it was, and um, um, we tested her to um, to um, the stuff that she had in her her salad, which was basically lettuce and celery and tomatoes and all that stuff, and she was positive to lettuce and celery. <clears throat> um, she could have those other times, didn't have any problem, um, but, you know, um, that's what she was positive to. So she stopped eating for a couple hours prior to having, you know, playing a game or whatever, and again, we never saw her again after that. She had an EpiPen and all that stuff, but she didn't have any further episodes, so, for whatever that's worth. Did, did you report that in the literature? No, I, know. So I, I was going to say it's probably where the celery came from. No, no, that was actually no, I think it was when I was a fellow. Yeah. Okay. So. Ten of one for celery. Yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, Dr. Ellis, who's in Canada, um, <clears throat> I think has the number of patients or something because she's been on uh, uh, the anaphylactic committee with her, and, um, and she talks about a survey that I think she had developed or something to um, – try to decide the risk for, or try to figure out how often this is a, this this happens because um, there's really not a lot of hard data on how, how often people see that sort of thing. But um, I, I've seen, you know, when I was a fellow, I saw two cases, and I maybe have seen a couple cases we thought maybe since I've been here, but um, um, they're not very common. So. Yeah, they're, they're rare. Idiopathic anaphylaxis, even with or without exercise, is a more common yeah. thing. And you know, lately, they've ended up having like the gal, gal type. Um, yeah. Yeah. And some of those are, you know, um, cell activation systems, yeah. which back when I was a cell, it wasn't even, a, you know, a, an idea at all. So.
And then a lot of them have vocal cord dysfunction when they yeah. exercise, mm -hmm. and that's called anaphylaxis because it's so scary, and they have yeah. they can't breathe, breathe, and they're misdiagnosed. Okay. So who, who knows what's really going on? We don't have a standard way of diagnosing these patients, managing them, and nobody aggregates a large collection to do a controlled study to see what's really going on. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a reminder to the fellows and the faculty here that um, if you are involved in the the um, app, uh, the well, interviewing well, applicants, um, we're having our meeting well, we at eleven thirty. We're done now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're done. Are you recording it? Yeah. Definitely. Great. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.